Good evening to everyone. My name is Mitchell Ash, and I have the honor to moderate this evening's panel discussion on the topic accountability. What does it mean and how can it be achieved in policy, politics, and law? A cooperation event of the American Academy in Berlin and the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities. And since we are in the Leibniz Saal this particular time, the last time we did a a, um, not a hybrid event, unfortunately, but an uh, electronic event sponsored through the American Academy. But now we're here in the Berlin Brandenburg Academy. So I ask the House here, the president of the Academy, to give us his first word of greeting. Of course, dear Daniel, dear Mitch, dear Deborah Amos, dear Lawrence Douglas, dear Tatjana Hörnle, and dear Otwin Rehm, of course. We could not have known how dramatically topical the subject on which we are gathering this evening would become. Topical has always been the question of accountability, its meaning and its reality in politics and law. However, in the face of an incursion in the middle of Europe in violation of international law, involving not only the Russian Federation, but also Belarus, the question of accountability is even more dramatic. I do not need to say much about this. Many of us have seen the photo montage showing Vladimir Putin in the dock at Nuremberg and the great European and transatlantic solidarity we are witnessing right now gives us hope that this is not just a photo montage, but a shrewd, by a shrewd photo editor on social media. An expert of ancient religions in the presidency of an academy is not an expert on accountability and should not try to present himself as such in a greeting, if I may. However, present two reading fruits on the subject by way of introduction. It is an observation from an essay by Maritza Lozano, Micha Mitchell Atkinson, and Heizen Mou, if I'm pronouncing the name quite correct, on democratic accountability in times of crisis from the last year. The three authors write, I quote, after all, it is easier to be accountable when outcomes are favorable, but favorable outcomes depend on adherence to the norms of democratic accountability. The democracies that suffered setbacks of various kinds during and after the Great Recession were those that had not only poor economic performance, but also high levels of corruption and little respect for the rule of law. Democratic resilience is more likely to be observed when government both manage crisis and adapt parliamentary operations to crisis conditions." End of quote. At first glance, it seems almost trivial to emphasize in this way the connection between accountability successfully established and the political process and other successfully designated executions of a democratic society. However, in reality, of course, such conformity to rules is not trivial at all, but difficult to introduce into everyday life and to maintain in everyday life. The definition of accountability proposed by Mark Phillips in 2009, I don't know whether you will accept or not, but this definition, I quote, A is accountable with respect to M when some individual, body or institution, Epsilon, can require A to inform and explain or justify his or her conduct with respect to M also seems simple in a certain sense, 
and is, in my layman's uh, opinion, so helpful for this reason alone. What is clearly and simply formulated, clare et distincte in Descartes' terms, can also be better demanded and verified in all day processes. I still remember how unkindly, almost derisively, Hans Jonas' Prinzip Verantwortung, in English, Principle of Responsibility, was spoken of within German university philosophy in my student days. When I studied philosophy in Marburg in the early 80s of the 20th century, this book was considered to bully by the Kantians and not visionary enough by the followers of Ernst Bloch's uh, Principles of Hope, Prinzip Hoffnung. However, why I'm introducing this central idea by Hans Jonas here at all? Well, responsibility and accountability are closely related. While responsibility refers to a person's duty, Regardless of whether something has already happened or not, accountability, in my opinion, you will correct me, accountability generally refers to what happens after something has happened. In a lecture on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the publication of Hans Jonas monograph, Wolfgang Huber pointed out that, like accountability, the principle of responsibility can only flourish in a culture of responsibility. The principle of responsibility must be part of everyday social and political life in a democratic society, and it can only do so if appropriate behavior is part of that everyday life and rules are established as well as practiced. In this respect, too, responsibility and accountability are closely related. I quote the words of Huber from 207, an ethic of responsibility can contribute to this most readily if it can be based on a freedom that is both secured and demanded by the law. In this respect, the preservation and further development of democracies based on the rule of law proves to be a task not to be underestimated for all those who are interested in responsibility shaping the future. German-English, quite long sentences. If one looks at the plutocratic, oligarchic, populist and presidential erosions of democracy in our time, a rich field of activity opens up in this respect as well. This is not the first event in the Berlin-Brandenburg Academy to address the topic of accountability. To my no small amazement, there was an event in 2003, for example, that addressed many issues that still concern us today and will concern us this evening. Edsel Reuter turned 75 in 2003, and my pre-pre-predecessor, Dieter Simon, spoke of a culture of rents responsibility and its practice in everyday life, and presented the jubilarian as an example of such everyday culture before hypocrisy. There is a lack of culture of responsibility in society, politics, and science. Simon spoke of a society of responsibility and of the fact that it is not easy to find someone who will stand up for what happens to us. We are really, uh, here we are really in the middle of our topic this evening, but also in the middle of the conflict over the Ukraine and what we here in Central Europe are doing or should have done long ago, as Timothy Gard Nash recently bitterly remarked. This is also not the first joint event with the American Academy, dear Daniel, nor the first joint event Mitchell Ash has organized. Mitch Ash's 
is a bridge builder between the Berlin University and Harvard University, already through his biography, but also through his activities at American and German, as well as Austrian universities, Vienna. I exceedingly appreciate his precise language. Das müssen Sie jetzt aushalten. His charming exhortations to differentiate more carefully and to discard, to discard inherited prejudices. And in preparing for this concise presentation of Mitch, I noticed that among Mitch Ash's many publications is one on the Schönbrunzo, which I absolutely must read in preparation for my next visit to Vienna. I thank him wholeheartedly for preparing this evening, again for preparing such an evening, and look forward to another opportunity to collaborate with the American Academy and with you, dear Daniel, to be continued. Oder Deutsch, Fortsetzung folgt. Ganz gewiss. Vielen Dank. Thank you, dear Christoph, for your kind words. And now I ask our the President of the American Academy in Berlin, Daniel Benjamin, for his words of greeting. Thank you very much, Mitch, and uh, thank you very much, Christoph. I have to say, following you in the line of introductions is um, an unvi unenviable task. Uh, nonetheless, I am Daniel Benjamin, and I am the President of the American Academy, and I want to welcome you all to this event, and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, for the event entitled Accountability, What Does It Mean? How Can It Be Achieved in Policy, Politics, and Law? Uh, I'd particularly like to thank Christoph for um, conceiving of this. Usually when Christoph comes up with an idea, it's well worth paying attention to. At first, it's like, accountability, really? Is there that much to say? It turns out there is. Um, and uh, I want to thank you for welcoming us tonight to the historic Leibniz Hall of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy der Wissenschaft. I also want to thank Wilmer Hale for its generous support of this event. Uh, I want to uh, also, of course, thank the panelists and specifically uh, Professor Mitchell Ash, great friend of the Academy, uh, and I think of all. Um, thoughtful discussion for his contribution in shaping tonight's event. Now, this is, as um, Christoph mentioned, not our first, but in fact our third panel discussion uh, with the Berlin Brandenburg Academy. And um, I'm looking forward to continuing this collaboration in the future. It's worth noting that this collaboration began in 2019 with a panel discussion 2019 was on the other side of another big division in history, and I don't mean my arrival at the academy, but rather the pandemic. Um, the transatlantic community of values, does it still exist? Just as an aside, uh, and against the backdrop of uh, the past week's events to our east, that important discussion, I think, has at least for a while been answered strongly in the affirmative, uh, and I think it has been done so unlike anything we've seen in decades. I am sure that the question will be asked and examined anew, and that's what we should do. We should continue probing, but I think that that is one positive piece of news amid an awful lot of gloom. So each panelist brings their own unique perspective and their own unique ex expertise on the subject, and that will give us a great opportunity to examine the concept of accountability from a variety of angles and to discuss its commonalities and differences in a genuinely interdisciplinary way. So without further ado, I'm looking forward to this discussion. And now, Mitch, I turn it back to you. Thank you all for joining us here live or virtually. As Adam Smith put it so well in the theory of moral sentiments, I quote, a moral being is an accountable being. Whether all of the meanings of the word accountability that we will be exploring here and have already begun to explore uh, in our words of greeting from the two presidents actually derive from this single basic principle remains to be seen. 
I could jump now straight to the crisis in the Ukraine, which is surely on all of our minds. I will not do that just yet, but you can be sure I will get there. Instead, however, I want to start by reflecting briefly on the title of this event. The reckoning that Christians expect on Judgment Day and that Jews relive every year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is also a kind of accounting. Your sins are recorded and judged. After an accounting by the divine authority, you pay the price, perhaps the ultimate price. It's not a great leap from there to the idea that accounting and accountability also have something to do with the law. First of all, tax law, as I just said, but also more generally with the right of property, which is guaranteed by law. Of course, persons accused of crimes must also be called to account in courts of law. That is the term in the old-fashioned English usage, called to account. All of these forms of legal accountability have to do with assigning or accepting responsibility, which is why it's so great that Christoph Marxies mentioned this term in his opening words. In German, the verb for this is verantworten, which is not easily translated into English. We might say someone has to own up to a crime. Accountability in this sense of assigning, accepting, or being forced to accept responsibility is one of the leading political demands of our time. But what does accountability actually mean? Whom exactly is being asked to be accountable for what? By whom? Is the accountability demanded of political actors the same as the accountability that criminal courts or the International Court of Justice in The Hague strive to achieve? Can these two kinds of accountability, political and legal, be separated, or do they merge with or bleed into one another? Are there yet other ways of construing this concept, for example, in academic research, from establishing historical accountability for past wrongs to establishing and correcting misbehavior in academic institutions. These are all questions about what accountability is in different contexts. But our panel also asks, as it says in the title, how accountability is or can be achieved. And that brings me finally to the crisis in the Ukraine. Thousands of Ukrainians have paid and are still paying the ultimate price, not for any sins of their own, but for a crime committed in essence by one man, the president of the Russian Federation. That it is a crime to wage aggressive war is a central principle of international law since the Nuremberg trials of 1945 and 46. But as Josef Stalin, a man admired by the current Russian president, contemptuously asked at Potsdam, so this very same time, how many divisions does the Pope have? We now face that question in a new form. How many divisions does international law have? Since military intervention has been ruled out from the beginning, one can economic sanctions, weapons also of a kind, from the arsenal of what Joseph Nye has called soft power, achieve the kind of accountability that is required in this case. Our panel discussion in this evening will explore the multiple, often vigorously debated meanings of accountability in these many contexts that I have mentioned here, and others as well. The panelists who are with us today are highly qualified to address these issues. Deborah Amos is international correspondent of National Public Radio and Ferris Professor of Journalism in Residence at Princeton University, and a fellow at the American Academy this semester. Lawrence Douglas is Professor of Law, Jurisprudence, and Social Thought at Amherst College and is also a Fellow at the American Academy this semester. Tatjana Hörnle, an expert on the theory of criminal law, is co-director of the Max Planck Institute for Research on Criminality, Security, and Law in Freiburg, honorary professor at the Humboldt University in Berlin, and a member of the Berlin-Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities. Ortwin Wren, an expert on the sociology of environmental impact and technology assessment, is scientific director of the Institute for Transformative Sustainability Research in Potsdam and also a member of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences. And spoiler alert, he will be talking about a kind of accountability that happens before 
a political decision is actually carried out rather than one that happens after. So there is a case in which that is also possible. The format of our first round of discussion is quite simple. I will address a question to each panelist in turn, which I hope will provoke a response. Perhaps I'll follow up to clarify if needed. And then in a second round, I will ask our panelists to respond to one another as they wish with the hope of having a discussion amongst us. After that, and I hope there will be time for this, I will turn to the audience um, and the Q&A function to take the questions or comments that may come from the listening public. If you're in the room, please just raise your hand and I will call upon you and there will be mics that you can use. If you're not in the room, um, I will hopefully be able to follow the Q&A function as you report your questions into the computer. I ask all of you who are following us online to formulate your question or comment briefly using that function. Members of the live audience need only to raise their hands, but as I said, but I ask you please also to formulate your questions and comments briefly. And with that, I now change places and start with my first question. Deborah, Amos, let me begin with you. In your statement for the American Academy, you wrote that you wanted to investigate whether and how people who engaged in torture or other crimes against humanity during the conflict in Syria can be called to account at the International Court of Justice. As you said there, the thesis was that the road to justice leads to Germany. Two weeks ago, I would have simply decided to ask you what you meant by that. But now, I have to ask you first whether the war in the Ukraine has led you to change your topic. I'll begin by saying that there was a question mark at the end of that sentence. Uh, does accountability run through Germany for a conflict that is 10 years long, that has displaced millions, uh, killed hundreds of thousands, tortured tens of thousands of people? Can you have accountability in a conflict that is not over? Um, I have come to learn watching the trial in Koblenz, watching the witness statements, that there are other things beside accountability that are worth having. As the witnesses from Syria said after they testified, it's a start. It's almost impossible to think that a trial, a single case, even though there are two more coming and probably another in France and another in England, these are these show us what the limits of the law are. Um, it is a great experience for those who testify. They feel like they are doing something and they learn something about justice and courts and accountability without a capital letter. But it's far from um, accountability with a big A. I don't have to do much except for pivot when it comes to Ukraine. When you talk to Syrians, they understand Russian tactics because they lived them before the Ukrainians did. In some ways, you could argue that Syria is the Guernica of Ukraine, that almost everything that you're seeing on the ground, they lived, including foreign fighters coming to fight in the conflict. So they know it. In fact, they are helping to organize uh, the protests, um, there are groups of Ukrainians and Syrians working together because they know it. So this doesn't really answer your question. And I'll say as a journalist, and this is not a cop-out, I always say it's not my job to answer that question. It's my job to witness people who are trying to answer the question. And as I dig deeper into the subject um, at the academy, I've, I've come to the idea that this is one of those occasions where, you know, excellence shouldn't be the enemy of good, that something important happened in Koblenz. It is not a full answer, but it is the beginning. Thank you for that, uh, Deborah. I th I, perhaps I would like to ask briefly of, for, uh, in a follow-up whether Syria and the Ukraine are really the same, because in the Ukraine, it's not a civil war that's happening in the Ukraine. Uh, it was in Syria, and, and it's not clear in Syria, you know, it's hard to demarcate aggressor and 
victim in certain circumstances and others not. And others, it's very clear who the aggressor is and who the victim is. If you bomb a city, that's clear. But at the beginning of the Syrian conflict, it was an uprising against an existing regime rather than an attack, an attack on another sovereign state, right? Correct, but it quickly became a different kind of conflict. It became a regional conflict within the first year. And finally, it became internationalized when the Russians uh, arrived and the Iranians arrived. So, yes, you're right. It is not like Ukraine in, in some ways because we're not talking about a border uh, and, a, and a neighbor. But we are talking about people who speak the same language, who see the future in different ways. Um, and one side was willing to break every rule of, of war to win. And you can argue that this age of impunity, you know, nothing happened to the Russians for the things that they did. The New York Times had a lot of coverage of bombing hospitals, bombing schools, and the world said, yeah, terrible thing that was. Um, and there, there was no accountability uh, at all. And so here we are. Lawrence Douglas, due to your expertise in law and social thought, you're ideally suited to follow up on this, uh, this discussion. Uh, the question I want to ask you is, is the law ever enough to assure accountability? Whether we're talking about the attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021, or the attack on the Ukraine, the question seems to be the same, even though the circumstances are obviously quite different. In both cases, enforcing the law, or even deciding what the law is, and whether to enforce it, is so wrapped up in politics, including efforts to manipulate the proceedings for political gain, that it seems impossible to separate the two kinds of accountability. Is it possible or not? And does it matter if it's not possible? Well, I guess to, to give the good German answer, the answer is yein. <laughs> um, so just to, to kind of maybe uh, answer that question, my work has largely been uh, devoted um, to looking at legal responses to episodes of state-sponsored mass atrocity. And in that context, accountability typically refers to the struggle against impunity. Um, and I think we should uh, bear in mind that that struggle can take a number of different forms. I mean, maybe the uh, paradigmatic or the emblematic vision that we have of the legal response to mass atrocity is the uh, Nuremberg trial of the major Nazi war criminals in 45 and 46. But we should also bear in mind, it's as Deb was mentioning, uh, the response to mass atrocities can also take the form of domestic national trials, uh, such as uh, the one that is now taking place in Frankfurt, uh, with Germany applying the principle of universal jurisdiction. Um, we should also bear in mind that the response can take a non-legal form. I mean, it can take the form of museums, such as uh, the Museum Against Genocide that we find in Phnom Penh, or the uh, memorial to the murdered Jews of uh, Europe that we find here in the, the heart of uh, Berlin. Um, now, what can we say about these efforts? Uh, I think it is fair to say that um, the legal work of accounting for past atrocity is necessarily and always going to be inextricably tied to the politics of the present. Um, but at the same time, something that I always try to kind of uh, instruct my students um, about is to say that something, to say that law is connected with politics is not the same as saying that law is entirely reducible to politics. It's, I think it's very crucial to keep those two ideas in your head at the same time. That law is inextricably political, and yet it cannot be simply reduced to politics. Um, I don't know if it's useful to kind of look at, for example, at the, the German uh, experience of accountability after World War II. I mean, I think we can, if we're focusing simply on legal responses, I think we can focus on three different things. We can focus as on the criminal trials that German courts undertook. We can look at the process of denazification, and we can also look at the process of reparation and restitution. I suppose we can stand back and say, how successful were these efforts? 
uh, with, with regards to the criminal trials, there were some notable successes that the German judiciary undertook. At the same time, I think we can say that there was also a pretty uh, substantial record of disappointment and, and failure. Uh, with regards to denazification, I think there we can say there was a very dramatic uh, experience of failure uh, in which you find hundreds of thousands of former Nazis um, being, you know, relatively quickly rehabilitated. I think we have to bear in mind, and I think this is something that Deb mentioned as well, that efforts at legal accountability in the wake of mass human rights violations are always going to be partial and incomplete and marked by uncomfortable uh, political accommodation. So is Vladimir Putin uh, ever going to be tried for uh, the crime of aggression or for crimes against humanity? The answer is in all likelihood, no, unless there's some kind of coup in Russia. But that, again, it's not an impossibility, but it's very, very unlikely. Uh, then, as this Yana book suggested, the very failures of legal accountability, ironically and counterintuitively, counterintuitively can contribute to peace and uh, political stability, at least in the long run, at least in the, the short term, I think. And then finally, and this I think goes back to the point that Deb was making, um, to call something a legal failure is, is almost to assume that a greater success was a real possibility. And I think uh, we need to simply ask the question, what does legal success mean in this context? What does justice mean in, the con in this context? I think we have an idea of justice that comes perhaps from conventional uh, criminal law that maybe simply is not applicable when we're talking to circumstances of mass atrocity. So maybe the legal attempt to achieve accountability asks us more generally to interrogate and question what we mean by justice. Thank you very much, uh, Lawrence. I think that you have provided us with a very good lead into to uh, the questions I wanted to ask Tatiana. <laughs> um, Actually, originally wanted to ask you the same question that I asked Lawrence, but with a more specific focus on your expertise, the theory of criminal law. I think we can still ask the same question, is the law ever enough? Because uh, there is, as, as you know better than I, an extended discussion now, uh, at least in the German literature and perhaps also in the American literature, um, about whether law can uh, actually have any meaning if there is no way of enforcing it. Um, that in other words, the idea of law has to be combined with the idea of actually being able to carry it out, mm -hmm. um, which is not always the way the theory of law used to, used to be, right? It was a set of norms. It was simply a set of norms and that was independent of whether you could carry it out or not. For that, you had a court system and you had parliaments and so on, but that was a separate issue from the theory of law. But now the two are being brought together, uh, I gather. Uh, at least I'm told that by, by my friends who are legal theorists. And so I suppose I should ask you now to address the question that Lawrence just raised um, in, in, with respect to the criminal law. That is to say, uh, I understand that um, international criminal law is not the same thing as criminal law uh, of the, the kind of trying someone for a crime, an ordinary, sort of speak, crime like theft or murder. Uh, but, of course, we can agree that there is a normative basis at work here. Uh, thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not steal do seem like basic minimum requirements for a civilized society to even exist. Um, but one could ask, nonetheless, whether the theory of criminal law addresses situations in which it's difficult or even impossible actually to enforce mm -hmm. such norms. Let me start with one of the uh, um, points you've presented that there might be or that there probably is a difference between national criminal law and international criminal law. And in order to explore that thought, I would like to start with the notion of accountability again, uh, a conceptual analysis. What exactly is accountability? And you already mentioned uh, to the two crucial elements. It's uh, the, the first question is accountability for what? And the second question is to whom? And very often the second question is somewhat neglected or not treated with enough seriousness. The question, who is the, the person who is calling to account? Who is the agent who is calling to account? And uh, it's, it's necessarily a relational concept. Accountability, I would say, is a relational con 
concept. You need um, someone who is called to account and you need somebody who is doing the um, calling to account. And if you don't believe that God is the one who is doing the calling to account, which is the tra traditional source of pretty much all of our morality, uh, then you need to identify another agent. This could only in a secular context only be some kind of community. And if you approach it from that perspective and then you go back to the distinction between national law and, and uh, international criminal law, in national law this notion of a community who calls citizens to an account is much more easy to understand and to put into practice also, at least well, I will come back to the difficulty um, uh, also. But in, in theory, and the theory is not always far away from practice, you would have a community of citizens who are bound together by social factors, by shared interests, by a sense of responsibility as a, as a shared sense within a community. But we already seen in, 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 in our contemporary time, and not only in our contemporary time, that the more communities, political communities, states are becoming highly fragmented, um, the more it becomes difficult to uphold that picture of a uniform community in a state which can uh, via national criminal law actually hold people to account. And this difficulty is obviously much more bigger even in international criminal law. That's one of the crucial problems of international criminal law, not only to get hold of the uh, culprits, but also to define the community who is actually doing the uh, to call, calling to account. And very often we apply some unspecified, unspelled out notion of a hypothetical community, all citizens of the entire world as the community who is calling to account. But this is very far off from a real community and it involves a lot of different and dif difficult questions then. Who is, I mean, I think we should, the, the notion of a community should have some real basis. The idea of having a merely hypothetical community is not very helpful because you have to answer questions like who has the standing to call to account and what are the shared norms according to which we are calling to account. So uh, I, I would like to try out a, a hypothetical statement or a hypothesis. Perhaps it's actually more honest to use another word and that is the simple word blame. We blame people for what they are doing and there can be reasons to blame. You can support um, blame with reasons. But blame is something which can be done externally. Um, while the notion of calling to account presupposes the sense of a commu community. And in some instances, it can be very artificial to invent this kind of hypothetical community. So perhaps blaming is actually the better word than calling to account. <laughs> that brings up a question that historians um, sometimes discuss in great detail and some simply prefer to ignore. Um, and that is what happens after a political regime changes, and um, which are then followed by trials. Mm -hmm. And the question then becomes, what is the purpose of the trial in those cases? Um, Nuremberg is a classic example, but uh, there are, of course, many trials uh, af uh, after unification. Mm -hmm. in the 1990s, addressing the issue of the state security police, the Stasi, and their activities and how to account for those or call people to account for those. The people who were shot at the, trying to cross the wall, uh, were the, the people, the, the shooters were put on trial and that was a very difficult set of trials um, in those cases because they were, quote, just following orders, unquote. In, in this case, it wasn't a cop out, it was the truth. <laughs> what do you do then? Um, in those circumstances, right? So uh, I was right here in the 90s while that was going on and was thinking the whole time, and this is something the journalists address constantly when they cover these kinds of trials. Are trials like that intended to be criminal trials or are they intended to be educational events? And if they are intended to be events that 
in, carry out a function of political education. Is the trial the right way to do that? Can I respond to that? Yes, please. I mean, I, I, I hate to say that. I wrote an entire book about this. I mean, I wrote a book about uh, didactic um, trials, and the argument was that it kind of uh, followed up on uh, Hannah Arendt's observation that uh, when you're dealing with an episode of mass atrocity, uh, there's always going to be an uh, incommensurability between uh, trying to even the scales of justice. I mean, the idea of kind of trying a handful of people never makes any sense. And if you actually look at the prosecutors who were involved at the Nuremberg trial, the Eichmann trial, uh, even at the Frankfurt Auschwitz trial, if you look at those prosecutors, they all say that we're not simply trying a single individual. We're actually trying to give an account. We're trying to actually teach history and we're trying to do it in as responsible a fashion as possible. And then it raises this very interesting question, uh, which a lot of people have argued about, which is, oh, well, trials are not a responsible va uh, avenue for uh, teaching history. And uh, they might not be as responsible as, for example, uh, preparing a uh, work by a sophisticated professional historian, but actually the record of these trials is pretty damn impressive. They do a pretty good job of at least offering a first account of history. And uh, the other thing we should bear in mind is relative to the work of professional historians, unfortunately, uh, these trials can, uh, they can galvanize a mass international audience. And so uh, a really a crucial logic for a lot of these efforts in international criminal law has not been simply to assign blame, but to create a historical account of the acts. This, was, uh, this brings us back to your proposal, Tatiana, to use blame. Um, perhaps one could say that blame works if you have an individual uh, before you, uh, but maybe it doesn't if you have a nation or a political regime before you? What do you think? Well, at least in criminal trials, you would necessarily have an individual sitting there who, who, is this, uh, who will be the person who is to be blamed. And I, I wouldn't say it's all about education. I mean, it still leaves an important topic which we haven't touched upon yet, the victims. Um, I think there, it, it, it's, uh, my, my idea to prefer the notion of blame does not mean that we should not have criminal trials anymore. It, it simply means we should not invent a community on whom we act, who, whose name we're speaking in, but it still remains the uh, legitimate idea to speak on behalf of the victims. So for me, that's a major, that's a major point uh, in, in, criminal, in, in the core of criminal law to speak on behalf of the victims. And I can say in the, in the trial in Koblenz, what was so impressive is for the first time, the losers were writing the narrative mm -hmm. uh, because there's no question about who's won that war. But the idea that you have a say in the narrative is so unusual. And people understood that mm -hmm. and valued it. The Truth and Reconciliation Commissions uh, following the end of the apartheid regime were an attempt to uh, establish a different kind of forum, but un unfortunately they were not as successful as people had wished they were, in part because they were connected with judicial proceedings. If someone uh, agreed to participate, they were treated differently um, than those who did not, and, and that's uh, in, in a judicial sense, I mean now. And um, that may, might have been a problem, do you think? Hmm. Yes, probably. I mean, it doesn't work as a hybrid model to say we're the, part of it is to illuminate the, the course of events and for historical reasons, for educational reasons, and at the same time being part of an individual response to individual persons, blaming them individually. They probably should be kept apart. I mean, that's my intuition. The hybrid model doesn't work. I mean, this goes back to the, the point that you would raise about the politics of these things. I mean, certain countries and certain nations are capable of undertaking a criminal trial. Undertaking a criminal trial that actually comports with the norms of the rule of law is a very, very difficult thing to do. And it's an exceptionally dangerous thing to do in a country that, let's say, is trying to transition from an authoritarian regime to a democratic regime. In the case of the South African 
uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I mean, Truth and Reconciliation Commission is a little bit like um, no peace without justice. It sounds great, but then you look at it more closely, it's like, really? Why does truth lead to reconciliation? Why doesn't truth actually lead to hostility and rancors and anger? Um, and the fact is, I don't think it was the case that South Africa could have undertaken criminal trials at the time. Hmm. In, the in, in the interest of trying to create a peaceful transition, they basically said, we are not going to do this. Our society cannot absorb the cost of putting former perpetrators of atrocities on trial. And so in that sense, I think the, South, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was dressed up in this very kind of nice way by Desmond Tutu and others, but I think ultimately it was a recognition of realities on the ground. It was a concession to political realities rather than a genuinely uh, rethought uh, approach to um, the process of accountability. Mm -hmm. To go back to the 90s, the Germany in the 90s, um, one could suggest perhaps that um, there both approaches were applied, were attempted. <laughs> um, and maybe that was also a mistake uh, to try to do both. Uh, whereas in other countries in Eastern Europe, uh, the decision was made to do what the South Africans did, which was simply not to prosecute the Secret Service people, uh, in part also for the same reason, to assure peaceful transition. Um, but there were people, of course, in those countries who were not happy with that decision mm -hmm. uh, at all for moral reasons yeah. or because they themselves were victims and they wanted to have a chance to articulate their perspective to put, bring in Deborah's point. Um, so these are the, that, I'm just very, bringing this up to give us an idea of just how complex these things can be. And now we have to pivot. <laughs> to Orchon Wren because he hasn't had a chance yet to speak and I already give, gave you a hint that he's going to be addressing something rather different uh, from the things we've been talking about so far. Uh, your work, Orchon Wren, focuses on the study of environmental or technical impact assessment. The sorts of activities that are now required, for example, in order to gain political approval for large airport construction projects, for the know about those, um, we might call this achieving accountability as a kind of prevention before something gets done rather than after something like an act of corruption or a war has taken place. We're all aware about the complaints about the delays that such impact assessments can cause in the completion of large projects. Uh, this is a, a never-ending song that is sung uh, because these uh, impact statements are getting more and more complex and more and more detailed so that they take longer. And so it's not just about uh, incompetence or monetary cost overruns, but also these kinds of things that can sometimes cause projects to take longer than they were originally planned to take. Others complain about the potential manipulation of such impact assessments in order to delay or even prevent the projects entirely. So my question to you is, is there any objective way of deciding whether such assessments are actually worth the effort that they require? Or, all those, or is that question not answerable objectively and it's simply politics all the way down? So we're back to the question of politics. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mitch. I would like in the beginning to uh, distinguish between three different dimensions of accountability because that is really relevant for answering your question. The first one is knowledge and ignorance. And a lot of people have excused their own actions by saying we didn't know any better. The second point is what we have discussed so far, and this is malicious, malicious actions. So people lie, they uh, do all kinds of bad things, atrocities, we said about it, and are they accountable for this, and how can they be accountable to whom? And a third thing is limitation or violation, better said, violation of due process. That they just violate process, procedural laws, and they can get accountable for that, even if it's not a bad outcome, but if they just violate you know, some of the kind of written procedural rules, they can be kept accountable for that. Now, why do I say this? When we talk about impact assessment, we basically are an instrument for providing the kind of information that may be necessary to avoid 
first the ignorance issue, but maybe also to point out to some potential for malicious actions, but also to make sure that the procedural rules are in line with what we would ex expect as impacts. So, specifically as a first point, I mean, if somebody turns up as a decision maker and says, well, I didn't know any better, then you can say, well, we had had an impact assessment before. Those impacts had been published. You should have known it. And we've seen it very often in, of course, all kind of legal um, trials where people say, I didn't know about it. And then the judge said, no, you should have known about it. You had the opportunity to know about it. So in that sense, impact assessment can help judges or can help society to make people accountable if they pledge for ignorance. And, and I think that's a very important function. Um, the second point, as I said, is if you have malicious actions, then, um, you know, if an impact assessment, for example, points out that there's a lot of potential, let's say, for fraud, or that there's a lot of potential uh, if there's not enough um, control or supervision uh, that those things can happen, then the setting can be made so that some of those malicious actions are not going to happen. Now, that's, of course, a very optimistic view, but that's the intention of it. And thirdly, of course, is that uh, impact assessment can help to change procedural rules. And, uh, and that maybe some violation of procedural rules are almost inevitable if you think of some of the impacts. So that's, I think, the one part of the answer that I would give that impact assessment is done whatever by scientists, by experts or whatever, can help to make accountable more realistic and to help also decision makers with their own accountability later on when they are asked why did you have done this or why did you have done the other alternative. At the same time, and that's I think is a kind of flip-flop of this uh, situation, that the impact assessors themselves have a specific responsibility and accountability because they can fall prey to the same three elements. They cannot acknowledge the knowledge that there, so they give a wrong impact assessment. Now, just assume all the climate change uh, models are wrong. I mean, you know, we have built billions now of uh, programs on climate change. Yeah. So, well, they are a little sense accountable for that, what they're saying, that we are running into, you know, a, a warming of uh, the earth. Uh, but secondly, they could also have, you know, personal benefits from giving wrong assessments. Uh, or they can be bribed for giving wrong assessments. And the third thing is, in the scientific you know, realm, it's also possible to um, violate methodological rules. And that, you know, and this kind of violation of methodological rules can have an impact in the way that, you know, the impacts either wrongly assessed or not, you know, accurately assessed. And let me close that this is not just a an academic discussion. We had a very interesting example in North Italy when there was um, a, a major earthquake there. And uh, the public officials had gone through their National Institute for um, uh, Seismic um, uh, Geology and asked them for an assessment. Well, there were three individuals, three uh, researchers who said, well, it may be eminent, but I would not recommend evacuation. A day later, we had a big uh, earthquake, 12 people died. And those three individuals who made the assessments were sued. So they had to go to trial, whether they are accountable for wrong impact assessment. The first um, um, level in the real system said, yes, they were responsible. And that uh, the institute had to, you know, actually pay quite a bit in terms of money, which of course was another issue because they're a public institute. Um, the appeal court said no. And so there's an interesting question about how responsible or how accountable impact assessors are if they're wrong.
And the very interesting thing was when we talk about the three dimensions, the first court order said they were wrong not because they had the wrong knowledge. They were not wrong because they had any malicious actions or had been bribed or anything else. They have violated some major methodological rules of um, seismic um, investigations. So that was what the court said. And the appeal court said, well, this first court had no expertise to say that. Um, and so they overwhelmed, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, appealed this uh, uh, decision and that, that uh, the methodological rules apparently were not followed all because they were asked to give a judgment within a day. Because, you know, that was a, so they could not follow all the rules for all those kind of seismic warning systems. And in the end, they, you know, um, uh, uh, were not um, um, uh, punished for for, uh, uh, for their impact assessment. Uh, but it raised a major debate among the impact assessment community, saying, you know, how will liable are we for what we are what we're saying and so we have this very interesting let's say um, um, almost dual situation that impact assessments are being meant to improve accountability uh, and as we said to prevent wrong decisions and at the same time they are also a part of being accountable and and that kind of I think uh, dualism is something that we still struggle with it's fascinating it's uh, it brings up the issue of course of what it means for scientists to be responsible yeah. um, in a very concrete way normally the demand for scientific responsibility is much more abstract yeah. and vague and in this case something really was hanging on it uh, but, uh, but as you also pointed out, as the, as the seismologists said in their own defense, we couldn't be responsible because we weren't given enough time to do it right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, of course, one, if, you're, if you're an earthquake victim, you might say, well, that's just a cheap excuse, right? Well, I mean, the issue is, I mean, no, you can see it from both sides. I mean, from the political side, you can say, well, we need to have that decision within or that uh, impact assessment within two days because, you know, the seismologists tell us there was something happening. Uh, from the side of the scientists, you can say, well, you know, we can't do it with uh, enough liability and reliability, so we better don't say anything. But then, of course, politicians say, why do we pay this big institute if you can't give us an advice? Um, so, you know, there is this dilemma. This is, a, 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 for those of you in the audience who are not familiar with this, the uh, Berlin-Brandenburg Academy is actually facing this issue at this very moment because there was a statement by the Science Council, the Wissenschaftsrat, uh, calling for academies of science to think about setting things up so that they could provide scientific advice in times of crisis. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, those of us who have asked to, to discuss this issue brought up the time issue very quickly. Because they say, you know, we don't work that fast. It's not our, that's not what we normally do. Uh, and the re it's not because we like being slow. It's because we want to do it right. And that come, <laughs> comes back a little bit to your issue about the uh, Berlin <laughs> the airport and so on, um, which I think was not really delayed because of impact assessment. But, uh, you know, the law very often requires impact assessment, environmental impact assessment, social impact assessment. And there is a specific time frame in which that has to be done. And that is normally sufficient. In crisis situation, it's different. And I think, you know, hardly anything is being done on a large political scale without some kind of impact assessment. Even it's done within the ministry because they all have their own, let's say, um, 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 uh, you know, impact assessment group uh, or it's being externalized to, to external groups and we have a lot of institutions that do nothing else but these kind of assessments and because the world has become so complex that if I'm a decision maker I cannot anticipate the consequences of my different um, decision options you know, and that's why we have all these experts coming in and saying well this is likely to happen if you do A, this is likely to happen when you do B and very often we have very complex probabilistic models to do that and then it's hard to to understand, uh, but nevertheless, it is always the issue first, uh, you know, 
how much uncertainty are we willing to communicate and, and how much ambiguity. And the second point is how much is this being instrumentalized by decision makers to justify their own action afterwards. And there, there's a word that brings up a word that hasn't been used yet, um, alibi. Um, the, the one can think, imagine at least cases in which impact assessments are ordered up, so to speak, to give politicians someone else who will take the responsibility yeah. for a decision that they should have been making themselves. Does that happen frequently in your, in your view? Oh, I think it happens quite often. I mean, the, um, you know, we have seen it now in the uh, corona crisis and very often that politicians come up and say, well, this is what the scientists tell us. And what the scientists can tell us is basically, I mean, that's fairly trivial, is say what happens if you do A and do B, whether that's desirable or whether that's something that uh, or you have other things that you need to consider, uh, that's a different question. But, you know, it's always been shortened to say, you know, I don't take the responsibility for this because there are some scientists who are giving me that advice. And, and I have, you know, personally experienced uh, quite a bit in, on various scientific advisory committees where, uh, for example, the EU came up to us and said, we want to change, you know, the basic framework how we determine toxic uh, chemicals. And, um, and there was a discussion about this to go from the no effect level to the low effect level and then take a hundred away from it. Um, and, and, and when we said, well, there are good advantages of taking this new you know, a toxic standard, but there are also disadvantages doing it. And we said yes or no. The EU told us, should we do it or not? Yes or no? And if you say yes, we'll tell you the scientists have told us that we change the systems. If you say no, we keep the old system. And, and it's, it can be as simple as this, you know, just coming back to a yes, no decision, which is understandable because the politicians at the end have to say yes or no. But, you know, putting the burden of justification on the impact assessment is a very critical thing because we never have a decision option that only has positive impacts. So we need to make trade-offs, and the trade-off is not a scientific issue, that is a political, a value-based issue. Could this not also apply to cases, uh, Tatiana, in which scientific advice is called upon in criminal proceedings? Uh, when someone is being asked to say, as an expert now, being asked to say whether someone is responsible, capable of being responsible in a legal sense for a criminal deed. And if the psychiatrists say in this case, uh, would rather not be so specific as that, but talk about uh, the differentiated way of the, the problems the person might have and so, and so on, that's diagnosis in other words, which is what psychiatrists are actually normally paid to do, um, and the judge says, that's all very nice, but that's not what I want from you. I want a yes or no answer. Don't we have two systems in conflict? Well, actually, in the, the uh, criminal law, uh, law theory, or theory of criminal procedure, and that's not only what the philosophers say, but that's actually what the, what the courts are saying, um, that's totally acknowledged, that it's up to the judge um, to decide the final question. And it's actually good practice not to force or not to insist on on the on the uh, uh, psych psychiatrist in this example to actually say was he guilty or was he uh, did he behave in a Plymouth way or not? Um, that's already built in the system. Taking us back to COVID, um, in this context, we could say in, that it would be logical uh, not to expect. Mr. Dr. Dr. Drosten, or people like him, to actually tell us whether we need to do certain things with regard to vaccinations or not, but that that's the, polit the politicians have to do that, whether they want to or not, um, because that's their job. Mm -hmm. And it's not Professor Drosten's job to tell them right. what to do. Mm -hmm. But isn't that, 
uh, have, if you've noticed, the journalistic coverage of these things doesn't seem to be so clear on that issue. Um, the scientists often get blamed when a policy is enacted that doesn't suit the public wish. Yes? Yes, obviously. I mean, it's... <laughs> it's uh... so again, we're back to the question of who is accountable, who is being asked to be accountable, right? But, the, 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 I mean, uh, this perspective of, of accountability, which is not the exposed perspective, um, I mean, for, for if you observe these procedures from the outside, it's easier to say, well, it's a scientist who is uh, telling us what, what is right or wrong. But, I mean, on every level, and on, on where, where to draw the boundary in, in criminal court, what exactly means not to have acted responsibility, with responsibility or in the political area where you have to weigh different interests. Of course, it's, uh, it's either a political or a legal decision, but it's not a scientific decision in all of these cases. But of course, you can, uh, you can put a scientist on a kind of public trial if, the, if there's a methodological issue, right? If the scientist short uses a shortcut, for example, or maybe doesn't exactly follow the rules of procedure, um, that would be all right. It's, of course, a question of who's raising the accusation. <laughs> I think what's interesting, and maybe uh, you have a better answer to this, because I've been both in the court cases as an expert in Germany and the United States, and in the court cases, in the specifically tort cases in the United States, I felt extremely unpleasant in the way that the issue was how credible is the expert. And the judge always said, or the, the lawyer said, please say yes or no. And if I didn't say yes, and I said I need to differentiate, sir, you have to say yes or no. And, and if, you know, one was not so familiar with it, but I felt very uncomfortable with it. But then I heard from other experts that that's a normal way. And again, that's something where I feel that science is given a role that it's not very adequate in terms of is this credible, the scientist or the other scientist credible? And then with yes and no answers to get through, um, you know, a very simplistic element of, uh, of the issue. I mean, the issue I was asked was, is evacuation possible in a nuclear accident? And then I said, well, it depends. And he said, no, that's not the answer. So yes or no, is it possible or not? And, and you know, and it was very difficult for me and uh, <laughs> I didn't know how to deal with it. But is that typical or is that something that you yes. feel? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not held accountable. <laughs> I have one question from the Q&A so far. And I want to encourage the people out there who are following us on streaming to uh, use the Q&A function um, if they have a question. And I'm going to ask this question now from the screen and um, see what happens. The people in the audience who are now with us physically are perfectly welcome to raise their hands and ask questions also. The question is from Ulrika von Pilar, and she asks, uh, it says, there are examples from Syria and Ukraine about Russian war crimes in both places. Could you uh, comment on the deliberate American bombing of a ho hospital in Kunduz, Afghanistan, run by Doctors Without Borders? There was no accountability there either. Why? Deborah, please. So, you know, when you said we'll, we'll talk among ourselves, I actually wanted to bring this up and ask Lawrence. Um, and it goes back to the Koblenz trial. The lawyers doing it there are aware that they are in this wave of a movement. And, you know, it's big here in Germany, and there are other countries that have universal jurisdiction, and, and they're moving. And, and so there's an interest in having momentum in, in these trials. But the second issue they talk about is, so if we only do Syria... If we beat up, not beat up, I don't mean that, in a, you know, if we, if we hold accountable a state that can't really do much um, and no one really cares that much outside of the people who are directly involved, if we can't do the hospital in Afghanistan, if we can't do 
Abu Ghraib, if, if we can't do all of that, if we can't even do Saudi Arabia's, uh, you know, crown prince kills a journalist in, in Istanbul, then does it lessen the value of these war crimes trials and, and universal jurisdiction? Well, does, does everyone know? I don't I think the mic has to. So first of all, it, just so people are familiar with what universal jurisdiction is. So universal jurisdiction is the idea that there are certain crimes that are so severe, war crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, such that any domestic national court could try a perpetrator of those crimes, even if that court doesn't have any of the normal, let's say, organic connections one typically needs to have in order to exercise jurisdiction over a case. And I do think that actually goes back in a little bit, this is kind of a roundabout answer to Tatiana's, I thought, terrific point about what community is actually responsible for bringing forth charges based on crimes against humanity. Like if, when Germany is bringing uh, a Syrian to trial, we can say that's a wonderful thing, it's ending impunity, but we can also ask like, well, we can ask this in a sense, it's a variation on your question. It's like, well, Germany failed to bring many of its own perpetrators to trial. Is this a way of actually so is the community that Germany is talking about, is there a sense their legal system talking to themselves? Is it an inner dialogue, an attempt to make good on a, their own sort of record of failures when dealing with their own uh, history of crimes? And, um, and likewise, you can raise questions about, you know, international justice. International justice, does it apply to the strong as opposed to simply the weak? Uh, there have been criticisms of the International Criminal Court. This is a fledgling court that's housed in The Hague. It was established in 2002. And people say it's basically a court for crimes that take place in Africa. And, um, and these are, you know, they're important criticisms. On the other hand, you should also bear in mind that I think many international prosecutors would say that when you're dealing with international war crimes, you really need to build what we might describe as an egregiousness standard into prosecutions. You can't just prosecute every horrible thing that happens in a war because there are going to be terrible things that happen in wars. It has to rise up to an egregiousness standard. And that's why you might make an argument that some of the things that the United States has done hasn't necessarily satisfied this egregiousness standard, whereas things about these kind of systematic violations of, you know, these massive systematic human rights violations in Syria rises to a different standard. There is, um, there is indeed this issue of double standards or multiple standards, so to speak. Who, is, who, who has the right to bring such proceedings it relates to the issue of which community is it, but it's not quite the same thing. Um, yes, please. Do you need to wait, wait for the microphone? I'm not an expert, but you raised, I think, a very difficult question. I had a discussion in order now to refer to the presence with a Russian, and that's a discussion you know quite well, human rights. They said, you have a certain understanding of human rights, but we have a different understanding. I said, no, there are certain human rights we agree upon all. And then there's a question, all. But if we, in a certain way, refer to the United Nations and the Charter and we signed the Human Rights Act, then at least we should stick to the principle. But if you, have, if you get confronted, let's say, with such, how do you say, a denial, then you have a question of, in brackets, hopefully I'm not totally incorrect, civilization. And then you come exactly again, that's the Western standard and that's the non-Western standard. But I would say in a certain way, there are certain rights I think we agreed upon. I'm sorry, I'm in German, let's say genocide, I think is an issue I think we should agree upon. It should be sued. But then you had the other question, and I was brought when I had to teach international law, right to protect. And at the moment, let's say my wife, she is American, and she was shocked what is going on at the moment in Ukraine. 
And I said, and came out, I said, of course, it's without justification, but I said, if you know that you have, what is it, 60 kilometers line row of trucks and you know they will kill, what is it, the, the people in Kiev, why are we not able to come out with a surgical strike? Then we are afraid. But in principle, it would be in favor of the population and what is it to prevent somebody from committing atrocities? We consider as inadmissible. And that is what is the right to protect, unfortunately, was turned down for certain reasons, unfortunately. Although the General Assembly had a different opinion of the United Nations. And, and certainly this issue about uh, right to protect um, is kind of a, a, a somewhat of a, a more sophisticated variation of the idea of wars of humanitarian intervention. And the idea is, yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. So you have a situation like Rwanda, where you actually had the Clinton administration instructing members not to use the word genocide, lest it create the necessity of intervening. Uh, then you have something like the air war over Kosovo in you know 1999 which is actually Madeleine Albright will you know, insist that this is a war of humanitarian intervention. And yet from another perspective, uh, to use a, a term um, that was introduced earlier, you could say this is an exact, it's an act of aggression because it was never actually authorized by the UN Charter. And so it becomes, again, an example of the way in which politics and international politics ends up um, interfering with and creating these dissonances with efforts to engage in some type of humanitarian actions. Perhaps it's simply yet another example of how difficult it is to separate the legal and the political dimensions uh, that we've been talking about before. Uh, yes, sir, please, you're next. Thank you so much for the fascinating discussion. I'm not a... I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, you, it would be helpful if you would identify yourself before, first. Um, I'm Dr. Gautam Chakrabarti from the European University of Viadrina. I'm not a legal scholar, but I work on the cultural Cold War, cosmopolitanisms in the Cold War, but I find this discussion fascinating. And my question relates to actually the concept of scientific accountability. It's a discussion between Professor Ash, Professor Wren, and Professor Herndler. Um, uh, we've all been confronted with, the, with discussions and debates and challenges to discourses of scientific accountability in the last two odd years across the, across the pond, so, 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 so to speak. Um, I was wondering, as Professor Wren pointed out in the yes-no binary, when scientists are expected to answer a question in affirmative or negative, does that not mean, uh, in a certain sense, a legal, political, juridical, or even social constriction of scientific doubt, number one. And number two, how can we then, and this is a more difficult question, and I mean, uh, I, I hesitate to ask this of esteemed natural scientists, but we do live in a society where the, uh, the natural science architecture, we've all followed the gain of function debates, Professor Dashak's petition during the early corona times and the whole controversies and debates around it. But we do live in a world where the word of the scientist is you know, sacrosanct. Now, the old question of physician heal thyself, so who's gonna build the cat? What mechanisms under current jurisprudence could be evolved to achieve scientific oversight and accountability by scientists and not like you know the sort of people who go on Fox News. I, I don't want to take sides, but you know, yeah. please please forgive me. Too late now. <laughs> Sorry for that. Anybody want to grab that hot potato? Yeah, I can start. Okay, Orton, please. Point. Yeah, I think uh, things are two extremes. One, of course, is uh, the hubris of science and saying we know better than politicians what to do, and some scientists get to that kind of uh, attitude. And the other one is to say every knowledge is created equal and the scientific knowledge is just as good as anybody else. And I think those two extremes are the ones that we, I think should avoid. I think that 
you know, the world is complex enough that we do need science of very good expertise to think about the impacts of our decision uh, options. And at the same time, we should be modest enough to say, well, that's one part of the decision making process. It is the impacts, the knowledge about impacts, how desirable they are, how we make our trade-offs, how other things need to be taken into account is something that is not a scientific issue. That's an issue where really political discourse is very important. And, uh, and the second element to what you're saying is, I mean, politicians in the end have to make binary decisions. I mean, that's what, you know, I think uh, was uh, Senator Glenn who said, I don't, um, uh, I only like one armed scientist because they cannot say on one hand side and on the other hand side. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so this is a, a tension that's out there. And I can sometimes see the point that to say, well, all the sophistication, all this, if then is too difficult to process, just tell me what to do. Um, and then, of course, scientists should say, no, that's, you know, we cannot tell you what to do, uh, but uh, we can give you a background uh, so that you have a better idea of what can happen if you do X and Y, and there are uncertainties and everything else there. But again, I mean, in a situation where there's crisis, then it's much more difficult to do this kind of communication. Um, in general, I think we should acknowledge that science has this ability to be better prepared to give good answers on the question what happens if I do X um, than intuition, but they still fail. And that's, you know, and that's the issue of accountability and I think uh, if you do it in a sense that you know, what I've said about the three um, categories. Um, you know, I think science should be accountable if they really neglect knowledge that's out there and or not telling the uncertainties or that they are really in terms of malicious acts and are being bribed maybe from one side or that they violate some of the methodological rules that are obviously they should take into account. Uh, so I think those could be three guidelines also for scientists to be sure that, you know, they're not overstepping their boundaries, but they're contributing what they, what they should and need to contribute to political decision making. One of the, uh, the this academy published um, guidelines for scientific policy advice in 2008. And one of the, one of the many principles outlined in that pamphlet was to make public, to report openly the sources of error and the uncertainties. Um, politicians may not like this, but it does ensure the integrity of scientific policy advice from a scientific point of view and makes it also clear to the politicians that yes, no is not the, not the job of the scientist. Um, this is, this would help. In the back, please. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the next person is here. Sorry, then, then, in the back. Yeah. <coughs> My question is... Would you, please, <coughs> would you please identify yourself? Russia is a permanent member of the Security Council. So, now the question is, how can make the members of the Security Council of the United Nations responsible for their attacks, for their breaking international law. This is not the first, the first case that Russia <coughs> attack uh, Ukraine. Think of Iraq, the administration, the, <coughs> the uh, administration in the United States, at that time, they have illegally attacked Iraq. Catastrophic results. France, also a member of the, member of the Security Council. They, at, France attacked, at that time, Libya, Gaddafi Libya. The results were catastrophic. They have destroyed these states, Libya, Iraq and so on. So my question, how can we make the permanent member of the Security Council responsible for their attacks, for their <coughs> breaking international law? No, this is the first question or the first as aspect of my question. The, the, the other aspect is how can we make the 
leader of these states <coughs> who break international law, how can we make them responsible in their own countries? That means we have to change the constitution of their countries that, oh, if I will be responsible for breaking international law, uh, law so I will be responsible in my own country. That means the constitution of these countries, of these members of the Security Council, permanent members, must, also, this is another aspect, but my question is how to change the uh, uh, charter of the United Nations that would make these permanent member of the Council of the Security Council uh, responsible, accountable for their breaking international. And how can we make them in their own states responsible for their breaking for the breaking of international? That's I think that's we've, that's, we've this understood. Is my Thank question. you very much. Does anyone want to take this on? Lawrence, please. Well, I mean, just so just so everyone knows what the the issue is. So um, there is the Security Council of the United Nations, and there are these permanent five members of the United Nations, and it's France, UK, United States, Russia, and China, and they all have a veto power over any kind of intervention. And so I think the idea is that uh, by exercising this veto power these states can actually make it very difficult to have some kind of international reckoning with atrocities. For example, the veto power was used and threatened, uh, which made it very difficult to, for example, have any kind of international legal response to the genocide in Cambodia. And so one of the things that we could think about is just a practical thing is to try to change the composition of the Security Council and stripping these countries of their, their veto. So that's just one practical thing that one could imagine that might address the concerns raised by this gentleman. Perhaps not terribly likely, but it's, it, is a, uh, it is, of course, this, this dilemma that you have raised is one of the reasons why the United Nations does not have the impact that it was supposed to have or that people dreamed, let me put it that way, dreamed that it would have uh, because it established very beautiful value system, broad principles in the charter, but the structures that it actually created for itself were not suited to carry out those principles. Uh, in fact, in, in the case that you have mentioned, uh, it makes it possible to subvert those very principles, as we have just seen with the, in the case of Russia's veto. Um, in most legal proceedings, Russia would not have voted in this case. It would have recused itself, right? But that doesn't happen in the Security Council uh, because the Security Council is not a legal body. It's not there to carry out judgments of law, okay? Well, it's a legal generative body. It can constitute law. Mm -hmm. For example, it is responsible, if you look, for example, at the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia that was constituted by the UN Security Council, the tribunal that dealt with the genocide in Rwanda was constituted by the Security Council. So it is a jurist generative body. In the back, the lady in the back, please. Hi, my name is Nancy Pick. Um, so very briefly, I just wanted to ask about um, our accountability for climate change. Um, one of the problems with it is that it seems so, in, so amorphous and, and that all of us are to blame. And I, I worry that our children and our grandchildren are going to accuse us of crimes against humanity on some level, that we know we have less than a decade uh, before we blow past this 1.5 degree centigrade change. And we seem incapable of making the changes that we need to make because war is much more dramatic on some level, uh, in part. So just wondering if there's any role for law, any role for accountability that you see? Fascinating question. Yeah. 
Yeah. Anyone want to, anyone want to take this? Up? Yes, I mean, that, it's an excellent example which shows ex the limits of accountability. Accountability is an individual concept that you um, have somebody who is made accountable uh, on, on, on behalf of a community. And if it ends up that everybody is accountable, then the, the, the whole notion vanishes. I don't think that, I mean, that, that, that's why, why it is so fascinating because we can't tackle this problem with a, with a, with our basic ideas of accountability they just don't work anymore yeah I mean, I mean the united states has got so, something that or maybe was talking about which is i mean we have this notion of of mass toxic torts so instead of just having you know individuals bringing suits you can have these class action suits but again they tend to be retrospective they don't tend to be so much prospective in nature um and I think that's uh, that's one of the the key challenges that's raised as a in terms of imagining some kind of juridical response to, to climate change. But I one think of the we um, have a little uh, change in terms of the um, recent constitutional law uh, jurisdiction in Germany, where it says the future freedom of uh, the next generation cannot be jeopardized by today's action, and that uh, that I think there was a, a major change, I think, in the sense of uh, what has been said before. And uh, basically it obliges uh, the political uh, decision makers to make sure that, um, you know, f whatever has been seen as the, uh, the budget for Germany in terms of uh, fossil fuel is not, uh, you know, surpassed or exceeded to a large degree. And so I think now the government is, in a sense, accountable after that jurisdiction to make sure that that is happening. Similar things happening also now in the civil law side, where Shell, for example, has been sued uh, in the Netherlands uh, for uh, you know violating basic uh, environmental um, climate uh, protection laws. And again, the first, I know, I mean, not a, a lawyer there, that uh, they won the first, uh, the NGOs were, won the first case, and now Greenpeace is suing Volkswagen for the same uh, purpose. So, yes, I think we have to individualize it to some extent and to say each individual has some kind of a proportion and there's some have a little proportion, some have a very large proportion, but those are the large proportion, large uh, 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 domain of, uh, responsibility and also of options that they can have will probably be persecuted uh, and I think that's uh, uh, you know however you want to evaluate it but it's certainly a first step towards making at least the major sources for um, climate warming being accountable for what they're doing whether whether I don't know whether this is a principle in German uh, speaking law or not but it is an American and uh, British law a corporation is a person um, a legal person, not a, a person like us, but a legal person. It's a convenient fiction which has, can be quite useful for these purposes. Uh, it hasn't been used very well it's up to now. Uh, Daniel is next. German cases. I was going to make the point that Ortfin made about recent German cases and I think also uh, the, the Dutch courts. But I would point out that one of the things that we haven't uh, discussed is the concept of democratic uh, accountability and what it is legislators and national leaders owe their, uh, their voters, their citizens, and things like that. So we're going to have to come back. Um, uh, a whole area of uh, uh, accountability that uh, we just haven't gotten to touch, really. Thank you for suggesting a topic for another symposium. We have, <laughs> we have one more person in the, who has already spoken, but he can now identify himself and ask another question. I'm awfully sorry I didn't introduce myself, former civil servant of the Foreign Office. Uh, I don't know if I'm correct or not, being accountable and being responsible. Uh, and you referred, and that was very important, corporations. Product liability. For example, as far as I remember, that was one of the first cases in Germany it was very difficult. Greenhage, I think pharmaceutical enterprise among others. And we had what has created a lot of emotions because of the handicaps being created by drugs being taken. But who was responsible for that? 
and it took a long time and the politics I think then interfered product liability let's say it was difficult in brackets to find out what is in brackets a scientist who could be how do you say accused of and in all in order to avoid that then you create what is product liability that because it was easier and the corporation had to pay and that was I think a major step forward so that opens up yet another area of accountability that we haven't discussed here uh, this evening. Can, can I respond briefly to Daniel's yeah, sure. point, just, just for Absolutely. one moment? Because it's an interesting thing in which the previous question about um, response to climate change, the notion of democratic accountability, how at least in the United States, in the unfortunate context of the United States, can cut in, uh, in opposite directions. Uh, the United States Supreme Court just heard a case on Monday uh, called West Virginia versus the uh, environmental Protection Agency and the issue in that case was that the Environmental Protection Agency was in a sense overstepping its um, administrative powers to regulate uh, climate change causing gases such as carbon dioxide and the idea, well, the argument that West Virginia was making is by giving these administrative agencies such power you're acting in an anti-democratic fashion that this is not a democratically accountable response and it should be going back to Congress and Congress should be giving directives to these administrative agencies and in the absence of these democratic directives these administrative agencies do not have the power to address these uh, existential problems facing us. We have one further question please. Yes, uh, I would ask uh, the question of too much accountability. <laughs> I'm a medical sociologist, Werner Vogt, and I know the example of birth medicine. Um, and there is the problem that a lot of doctors uh, are accountable, bit, accountable for problems, for faults. And uh, that uh, has the consequence that in many regions, in Switzerland, in the um, United States, there is less birth medicine than necessary. So uh, I think that we could this expand in other fields, maybe accountability of scientists. And the problem is too much accountability is less responsibility because responsibility uh, means to be uh, go in an uncertain field and make uh, decisions. And in a political leadership is this is also we have to make decisions in an uncertain field. And if we have too much accountability, then only the bad guys, the psychopaths who say I'm like godlike, uh, take the job. <laughs> And uh, I think we had to, to discuss it, uh, the other side. Although, I, you know, strangely, I actually did a story about this uh, in Las Vegas. And the story was this, that it was a town that was about to have no gynecologists. And it was because it, it so anyway, but I'll just finish that sentence. Um, because the insurance um, premiums were too high. And doctors couldn't afford it anymore because there are so many suits for doctors who are delivering babies that um, they were all shutting down. So it's pretty specific to the medical profession, both the insurance premiums and the individuals who come back and say, you damaged my baby and I will sue you now. Um, I'm not sure if you have insurance for when you are forced to say yes or no when you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it makes it a little bit different. But, but perhaps it's a broader point. I, 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 I'm glad about your, your, uh, your, your statement because I think uh, accountability perfectionism is something which we should be aware of. It's not something which is good for societies in general. So I would I would extend that beyond the technical question of uh, uh, assur assurance and, and medical professional liability. But um, I mean, we, we need and, and that's a new that's an interest. I mean, obviously there's no answer to that. What is the right dosage of accountability? But I, w I, w I would say there is one. It's I mean, you can have too much accountability it's possible and if I might just follow up also I think in the United States it's interesting to observe that relative to you know West Germany uh, the United States has a 
quite underdeveloped welfare state. Um, much less generous welfare state. And in certain ways, this regime of accountability that you find exaggerated in the United States, I mean, it has the reputation of being this highly litigious society. I think one of the logics behind this regime of, of over-accountability is that it almost serves as a, as a proxy for redistribution of wealth in the United States that um, because we have an underdeveloped uh, welfare state, we leave it to things like tort law to serve the purposes of uh, redistribution. Very inefficiently, I should mention. But do Very really, problematically. But do really poor people benefit from tort cases or is it actually the rich that benefit? No, I, I mean, certainly you will find people who, again, this is just anecdotally, mm -hmm. you will certainly find people who are talking, you know, who will, uh, believe that uh, that is the way the United States functions in a sort of um, distributive fashion. This is why I said, that's why I ended by saying it's problematic and inefficient. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is, I, I think, a, a kind of um, a proxy for the failure to have a, a more robust welfare state and social uh, welfare network. I think uh, we are at a point now where we can talk in the other room over wine and pretzel on the question of whether Germans are more litigious than Americans. <laughs> um, and in, the, in that spirit, I would like to thank everyone for having stayed the whole time and followed this discussion and to thank our panelists for their uh, really open discussion with one another, which was, what I was exactly what I was hoping would happen, and to thank our two Academy presidents for willing, being willing to sponsor this event.